So to begin, I would like to welcome the arrival of our Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, Professor Dr. April Kamila Ruslani, accompanied by the Honorable Professor Dr. Noor Aisha Muhammad Taib, Professor of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. I would like to invite the audience to stand up as we will start this inaugural event with the national anthem followed by our University Malaya song. If I may invite you to take a seat, Professor Dr. April and Prof. Noor Aisha, as long as with our audience. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera diucapkan kepada semua hadirin yang dihormati sekalian. Mencari timba si anak dara di bawah sarang burung tempua. Salam sembah Pembuka Bicara, selamat datang untuk semua. Selamat datang ke syarahan perdana Prof. Dr. Nur Aisyah Muhammad Taib pada hari yang berbahagia ini. Izinkan saya untuk bertutur dalam bahasa Inggeris untuk sama-sama menghormati dan meraihkan para hadirin dari luar negara. I would like to extend our warmest welcome 
to the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, Professor Dr. April Camila Roslani, the Honorable Professor Dr. Noor Aisha Muhammad Tai, Professor of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, distinguished guests, professors, doctors, ladies and gentlemen who are joining the inaugural lecture virtually and physically today to this very special event hosted by the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. I'm Dr. Suniza Benti Jamaris. I am honored to be the Master of Ceremonies for this inaugural lecture of my very inspiring supervisor, Professor Dr. Noor Aisha. A Professor inaugural lecture is one of the University of Malaya's cherished tradition. This lecture honors the professional journeys taken by professors and provides an opportunity for, opportunity for them to share their wisdom, inspirations, and philosophies. We are grateful today to be here as an audience for this inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Nur Aisha, a dedicated and passionate senior consultant, breast surgeon, and also a head of the UM Cancer Research Institute, UMCRI. Today, Professor Dr. Noor Aisha will be sharing her journey in the field with us in this inaugural lecture entitled Impacting Quality Care in Breast Cancer, Global Going Local. Without further ado, I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Professor Dr. April, to chair the lecture and subsequently to introduce Professor Noor Aisha Mohamad. Please welcome Professor April. The Honorable Professor Dr. Noor Aisha Taib, Professor of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum, salam sejahtera, and greetings to you, whether you are joining this inaugural lecture physically or virtually today. She stood in the storm, and when the wind did not blow her away, she adjusted her sails. These were the words of Elizabeth Edwards, American attorney, author, healthcare activist, but most pertinent to today's lecture, someone who lived with breast cancer. Edwards' quote says much about the resilience and adaptability of those living with breast cancer, and I include those healthcare providers under this umbrella need to have. Despite increasing awareness, flourishing research, and better treatments, breast cancer continues to cause significant mortality and morbidity, particularly in our part of the world. Our orator today has devoted her life's work to understanding the complexities of translating breast cancer best practices into our local context. Professor Noor Aisha Taib is a true blue University of Malaya homegrown talent. Having obtained her MBBS in 1995, her Master of Surgery in 2001, and Doctor of Medicine in 2012 from this very institution. She has gone on to serve her alma mater as a senior consultant breast surgeon, subsequently receiving a graduate diploma in genetic counseling from Charles Sturt University, Australia in 2010, finally attaining professorial status in 2012. She is currently head of the UM Cancer Research Institute or UMCRI. And in addition to facilitating cancer research generally, she has also supervised numerous doctoral and master's students, including 23 from the Clinical Master of Surgery program. Her strengths in the research sphere are readily visible 
through her 194 publications in peer-reviewed journals with a strong emphasis on patient care and outcomes. In the clinical sphere, in addition to being a trainer for the Clinical Master of Surgery, she is also an examiner for the breast and endocrine surgery subspecialty examinations in Malaysia. Other national roles include membership of the National Committee for Breast and Endocrine Surgery, Specialist Evaluation of the Malaysian Medical Council, founding member and past chair of the Breast Chapter of the College of Surgeons of Malaysia, and past honorary treasurer of the College of Surgeons of Malaysia. Internationally, she has been appointed to the Breast Surgery International Council as a member which has a particular interest in outreach to underserved regions. Professor Noraisha has driven many breast cancer advocacy initiatives as Vice Chair of Together Against Cancer, a cancer advocacy NGO based in Kuala Lumpur with representatives from all regions in Malaysia. She is the local leader of the Greater Pataling City Cancer Challenge, or GPCCC, application, alongside the Nas National Cancer Society of Malaysia. In addition, she is the principal investigator of Rabung, an interdisciplinary community study that looks at reducing barriers in the early diagnosis of cancer among the urban B40 group. As co-principal investigator of the emphasis study, she explores how patient needs and health systems can impact breast cancer survivorship care plans in Malaysia. There is no better person to explain to us how global going local impacts quality care in breast cancer. Professor Noraisha, the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good day to everyone. Thank you very much for making your time to come over to this inaugural lecture. And I know my team is still not here. They're probably still running the breast combined clinic in uh, the oncology clinic today. So global going local. I think I, my emphasis in my work is mainly local. Um, but we know that global affects local and local affects global. So I'll just put a picture first before I give any lecture because it is always very important for someone to know how they feel when the word breast cancer comes to light. So if I go to a community uh, education outreach, they will just point the little wilting white flower. But when I go to see cancer survivors, guess which one? Which picture would they choose? Pardon? The trophy? Yes, some of them choose the trophy. Some of them choose the gift, some of them choose the dice, but most of them will choose the money back. All right, so it is a very expensive uh, venture when someone gets cancer. We have many role models for breast cancer, and some are local, some are global, but sometimes how we see a cancer patient will affect the way the patient accepts treatment. Men can also get breast cancer. So I think, I think my brother's generation will know who this guy is. I don't know who he is, but he's from KISS. So he's the drummer of KISS, and he had breast cancer. So males can get breast cancer. It's about 1% of all ca breast cancers are males. And if they have breast cancer, it is likely that they carry a genetic predisposition. So let me just outline what I'm going to do today. I don't want to bore you. And I know some of you are feeling a little bit worried. Oh my God, one hour? And then somebody told me, unlimited. You can speak as long as you want, as much as you want, or as little as you want. So we'll see what happens, okay? So is there really a case for investing in cancer? Do we really invest in cancer in our country? So chapter one, See, it's going to be a long lecture. You're going to be here till tonight. 
why women present with advanced disease? This is actually my research questions ever since I started working because every time we see a breast cancer patient, wherever you are, in Kelantan, in Selangor, in Johor, usually they, they present very advanced, right? So why, 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 why? Okay, chapter two is looking into genetic predisposition. Who are those people who have a higher risk of developing breast cancer? And chapter three is quality improvement projects. I think many years ago when I started work, when I used to work with Professor Yip, you can see her there. She is my mentor and I call her my Chinese mother. So she, um, many years ago, I think we don't know what really is Aisha doing because Aisha likes to do so many things. And then finally, I think after about 20 years, Professor Yip, I think it's called Quality Improvement Project. So this is something that I will just uh, briefly um, touch upon. And I will share with you the students that we have who have had many impact into the practices that we have in this hospital. And the last chapter, of course, is advocacy. I think, I think growing up in the university, and I'm really a local girl, I live in PJ, I, I was born in PJ, and I work just across KL, but from PJ, right? It's very close. I think it's important that we look around us and see what's happening in our communities. So I think without us helping, people in the community to advocate for better care, it will never happen. So I think academia plays a major role in advocating for better care. And it's, it is our role really to educate our public as well as to empower to the, making a lot of the policy changes. So why breast cancer? A lot of people say, oh, you know, is it really that important? So this uh, slide shows the top cancer per country, um, don't bother about that, estimated age standardized incident rates. Those are very important for public health specialists, right? But in 2020, the pink had overtaken the blue. Previously, lung cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in the world. But in most countries now, you can see that the pink has overtaken the blue. So breast cancer is a major global issue. I forgot to remove my mask, shall I? So what about Malaysia? So this is the top 10 cancers in Malaysia. So the first one is breast cancer. So 19% of all cancers, male, female, or whatever, is 19% of all cancers. And then we have second, colorectal cancer, another important cancer because it is preventable and curable at early stages. And then of course we have lung and then so forth, you have the other cancers. So what is happening with breast cancer? So breast cancer, we do have a national cancer register and this national cancer register has been able to report trends because we have two reports out and I think currently they are still collating the one 2017 to 2022 that's still currently being collated. Um, but you can even see that the trends are not very um, encouraging. Because you can see for the earlier 2007 to 2011, the red bars, okay, if you look more towards the left, the stage 3 and 4, you can see that the, the orange bars are increasing. So that means stage 3 and 4 is actually increasing, not decreasing. So stage three and four means the cancer is more advanced. And because breast cancer is, I know someone there who will say it's a visible cancer, it would be something someone can know about. They have symptoms, but they don't present early. So you can see that the trends are alarming. What about the outcomes? So this is the relative survival by country for breast cancer. And you can see that Malaysia is not doing very well. So the purple bar is Malaysia, and the other bars, as you can see, this is for five years. So in Japan, in five years, if there were 100 women, about 89 will be alive. But in Malaysia, it will only be 67. In Singapore, it's about 80. So we're not doing too well in breast cancer outcomes. So now I'm going to talk about investment in cancer. I think cancer doesn't look visible to Malaysian policymakers. Because, because look at the fifth 
cause of death in our relation statistics. So the fifth one is neoplasm of the lung, bronchus, and trachea. You don't see breast cancer, so you don't know where it is, right? But, but why is it number five? Okay. And, and even transport accidents is more common cause of death than cancer, right? right? If you look at these figures. So, so I, do you think the policy makers will make a case for it? I don't think so. So, so now you look by sex, by, by male or female. And, and if you look at the causes of death, okay, the, the, the lower bar, the the lower bar, bar is the more common cause of death. And as you go higher, higher, that's the least common cause of death. So you, you can, can see that, that it for males, I mean, I mean for females, breast, breast cancer is actually number four cause of death in Malaysia. So what happens if you put all the cancers together, right? I didn't show overall um, outcomes, but this is premature death, which is more important, I think. Because premature death is people who die between the age of 30 to 69 years old. Okay, and, and you can, can see that, that when you put all the cancers together, lung, colorectal, breast, it is a number two cause of death in Malaysia. And I think we have to advocate that policy makers really realise that cancer is a major problem that we have to face. All right. So globally, you wouldn't believe it, but actually back in 2017, they have actually recommended what would be the best to do in lower and middle income countries in terms of improving the um, the presentation of cancer to make it to downstage the cancer, right? And you can see that the best buy effective intervention includes vaccines. Okay, we've heard of vaccines. So vaccines can prevent cancer. So HPV vaccination can prevent cervical cancer as well as liver cancer. So hepatitis vaccination can prevent uh, liver cancer. But, but if you look, look at the black stars, stars those are the screening that we should do. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's very, very wordy, wordy, isn't it? But, but do you see tumor markers, markers everywhere there? there? Okay, a, a lot, lot of people with money who pay out of pocket will go for cancer screening every year. year. And what do they do? Tumor markers. markers. It is a big business, I think, that, that does not affect the best outcomes that we could. So, so this, this is evidence-based uh, screening that lower middle income countries should undertake to actually uh, downstage cancer. So you can see for screening, the only screening that they feel would be the best would be for cervical cancer, the top best buy, right? Okay, you can do a HPV test every five years and if it was negative, you wouldn't have to do it for the next five years or 10 years. A pap smear, smear can also be done, done so, so that's, that's also a best buy, right? right? But, but if you look at uh, breast, breast cancer, cancer, screening is almost like the second tier best, best buy, okay? So, so two years, uh, uh, every two years, years for women age 50, 50 to 69, and it's for lower middle income countries, okay? All right? So, so I'm, I'm not going to go into the other details, but you can see that the little red, um, you can see the brackets in red, those, Those are, are all about, about treatments. treatments. So, so when you have, have good treatments, treatments it's, it's actually your best buy. And, and this is for colorectal cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer. And basic palliative care should, should be provided in the, the lower and middle income countries. So, so as, as a global breast cancer health initiative that, that was launched, launched by WHO in March 2021, there is a move to encourage lower middle income countries to downstage their cancers, to reduce global breast cancer mortality by 2.5% every year until 2040. So this is a new target. 2040, we should see uh, averting an estimated of about 2.5 million deaths. And how do we do it? There are three pillars. Number one, health promotion. Have we done enough? Have you seen a good health promotion for cancer in Malaysia? Let's ask ourselves. It could be new research questions for our students. Timely diagnosis. So that's the second pillar. Do we know that we can get our cancers diagnosed within two weeks? Or what they have suggested is 60 days from the day they present with a symptom until they get that diagnosis. 60 days is the global target. Okay, and the last one is comprehensive treatment and supportive care. 
So we have to focus on these three pillars to be able to avert 2.5 million deaths. And this is something that we are trying to do. I think all the practitioners, public health specialists all over the world is all aiming for this. How about Malaysia? Do you have a plan? So national strategic plan for cancer control has been published. And this is the targets for 2021 to 2025. So you can see that we want to downstage cancers and not just breast, breast, colorectal and cervical cancer, right? And we want to improve the five-year relative survival rate for colorectal, breast and cervical cancer again. Okay? So you can keep on hearing these three cancers are probably the top cancers that we could actually do the most impact with. All right? And of course, you want to reduce the premature mortality. And this is really a global target where we are targeting this uh, uh, sustainable development goals in 2030 where we should be reducing mortality rates based on the, the non-communicable disease. Okay, I'm not going to go too much. Uh, okay, so, so do we need cancer screening or do we need early diagnosis? So is there a difference? People, you know, when you talk to anyone, everybody says, okay, let's do screening. So what is screening? And what is early diagnosis? There is a difference. So let's look at the concept of screening. So screening really is when someone who is healthy, who does not have any, any, any symptoms at all, they may harbor some abnormal cells or pre-invasive cancer, okay? And then they are quite well. They have no symptoms at all. In those type of people, we do screening. We are trying to detect cancer when there are no symptoms at all. But when the symptom starts, okay, there is a symptom onset, then we call it early diagnosis. For breast cancer, as I think Datuk Sri Yusuf already says, is a revealed cancer. And hence, the patient should be able to detect a cancer at stage 2. So early diagnosis is more for people with symptoms, right? Okay. So how do we do early diagnosis? It's really being able to strengthen the health system first, to come to early diagnosis first in the lower middle income countries. And why is this important? So if we look at the US, okay, again, very busy slide, but you can see from the 1950s up to the year 2000, what was the best impact in terms of reduction in mortality? What reduced the death rates? Was it really screening? Or was it really people with symptoms having a, a very early diagnosis and having good treatments? So you can see that in the 1950s up to about 1975, there was a reduction in mortality. You can see the green slope going down. The death rates are actually going down. And that wasn't because of screening. Because screening never existed for breast cancer before the mid-70s. Okay, And you can see the slope is quite steep. So that means just by detecting someone between a very locally advanced cancer, which is a, what we call stage 3 cancer, and then you bring them down to stage 2, you can actually improve a lot of the survival rates. And when the introduction of screening, you can see that the slope is not as acute. It becomes a little bit more... Um, I don't even know the word, my God. <laughs> Sorry, losing some words here. But essentially, it is not as steep as the first um, 40, uh, 30 years, right? Okay, so screening does improve survival. But in our country, because a lot of people are presenting with stage 3 and 4, we can make a huge difference, a reduction by probably about 30% in terms of mortality if we diagnose them early without screening, that means we detect people with symptoms. So that is where we come to the first chapter. My God, I just got into the first chapter. Check time. Okay. All right. So why women present with advanced disease? So this is what I did during my doctorate many years ago. And uh, it was really trying to understand why people presented with cancer. And I had to undertake this very intensive method called qualitative research. And I used, it, I used a constructivist grounded theory to do it. Oh my goodness, I shouldn't have done it. I'm a surgeon, you know. Okay. So these are some of the quotes from the patient. I knew since five years ago 
I didn't care so much. I didn't want to think it was cancer. I continued being busy with work until I could not stand it anymore. When it became so painful and large, I went to see a doctor. Another patient said, Later on, I started coughing. It was during the festive seasons and I was making cookies. I was coughing with a lot of phlegm. And then they told me I had water in the chest. Then I had the worst headache until I was bent over with pain. The oncologist told me it affected my sense of balance. She showed me the cancer was at the back of my head. So these are the voices of people with advanced disease. So out of all that qualitative uh, study, okay, oh, I think this thing just popped up. And what I wanted to show here is that it's not just breast cancer that has very advanced disease. So you can see the problem lies in all the cancers. About 75 to 88% of lung cancers is stage 3 and 4. For colorectal cancer, it's 63.8%. Cervical cancer is 38.5%. So from the study I did, I came to two models. I'm not going to bore you with it, okay? But essentially, it sort of deconstructed the problem. So where is the problem? So these are the points of breast cancer delays. So it could be when the person just notices a symptom and finds it too difficult to see someone, too scared to go and see a doctor. Or it could be at the point when they go to a clinic, the doctor didn't recognize the symptom that this is breast cancer. We have young women who've just had delivery and all this and found that they have a lump and the, the nurse will say or the doctor will say, oh, don't worry, this is a milk lump, just wait. And before you know it, six months later, it's a huge stage three breast cancer. Okay, Or it could be scheduling delays in the hospital or it could be the patient not being able to make decisions when they want to undergo treatments. So then I delved also into why do they do this at those stages of delays. So there are multiple reasons. So they are uh, related to the disease, related to the treatments. A lot of people are scared of chemotherapy. Some people are scared of having mastectomies, right? Or it could be their resources. Could they cope with the diagnosis? Or they could cope with their finances, okay? All right, so... In many ways, I then embarked with a, a very uh, diligent PhD student from University of Science Malaysia, and we looked into delays in presentation, diagnosis, and treatment of breast cancer in six public hospitals in Malaysia. And we found that actually um, there was about 35% of people who did not turn up when they could. They had presentation delay. Um, about 40% had diagnosis delay, and about 36% were delayed at the treatments okay so i'm not going to bore you but essentially we actually you know sort of figured out if you were a non-technical person and you wanted to study how people delay treatments so we we actually detailed the processes and then we came up with this thing called the breast cancer care timeliness framework which will help non-technical people it will save a lot of time for people to just collect these dates to know where are the delays in breast cancer so then, after knowing all this, you know, why, you know, at some point as a student, when you were in the deep blue sea trying to write that thesis out of qualitative research, it almost, I told myself, I'll never do qualitative ever again, okay? But then, you know, then suddenly you find that after a few years, they say, oh, you must do something about this data. You must do something, right? And those frameworks can help us design our studies, so implementation science is something that is quite new in Malaysia, but I think um, we have more people trained in this area and there are people who just delve into the research and learn as they go along. Okay, So what it is um, for cancer, we know that consumer research has shown that structured implementation strategies designed to target systematically identified barriers can improve treatment uptake. Okay? So it can be a powerful tool all right, and look at the key principles. So there must be stakeholder engagement, application of theoretical frameworks, and rigorous ongoing evaluations. So this is the main principles of implementation science research. So then we come to Robong. So Robong is reducing cancer early diagnosis barriers in the urban B40 group in Selangor. So this one is massive, okay? This is the most massive thing I've done in my whole life, uh, you know? except for my kids, lah, you know, okay? So, um, 
I think there are a lot of people here who are involved in this study, but essentially this is a very complex uh, intervention study that we took. Uh, we we wanted to target the urban population. Okay, so why did we want to target urban population? Or everybody says, hey, you should go to the rural areas. It's worse there, right? But look at the data. In 1970, that was when I was born. Uh, people were living in the rural areas in about 71.6 percent. Okay. But in 2020, only 25% are still staying in the rural areas. So we are actually more living in the urban areas in Malaysia today. Okay, And, and in the urban hospitals also, we can see disparities in survival rates. So we see that in the UMSC or the private wing, the survival rate is five-year overall survival is 87%. And in the public hospital is 71%. So why is this so? So when we did our analysis, and I think some of my co-researchers are here, um, it f what was found was that really it was the advanced stage at presentation. Not so much of treatments, but really the stage at presentation. Okay, so we chose a little location in Petaling Jaya called Taman Medan because it was uh, doable, small enough to study. Okay, and we had to do a lot of uh, stakeholder analysis. So we had to understand. I, I was never a very political person. I never really wanted to understand politics very much. But I had to. Okay. So there is a, a parliamentarian in Petaling Jaya who is in Tama Medan, and there were about three dons, and we actually chose the don in Tama Medan to cover that area. Okay. And um, so this is the study. So the study has something like five sub programs. It has all these people here who has been working very hard to look into different areas of the problem. So for me, I am more looking into the cancer care pathways. So I'm with uh, Dr. Hamiza. She's our program manager. So we look into the care pathways. What happens when somebody needs to have screening, cancer screening, and if they need to have a diagnosis, where do they go? Which hospitals, right? And then sub-program two is Dr. Lai. She's from the... Um, Faculty of Arts, she's a gender studies expert. So she looks into the empowering or disempowering social, cultural, religious and legal factors towards early diagnosis of breast cancer. And we are also working with a lawyer, Dr. Eshadol, because we really wanted to understand, can you really share patient information across NGOs and clinics and hospitals, right? So we wanted to understand that. So there is a legal person involved in this study. And then we have Dr. Lee Yu Kong. I think he's somewhere in the crowd there. He's looking into how people communicate in the urban B40 group in terms of looking into their health communications, right? And we have a PhD student there, uh, Ms. Hikma. So uh, sub-program four is really looking at developing a training module for cancer uh, navigators in the community. And this is led by Dr. Hyrin. And then we have, um, uh, I think we miss Dr. Suniza. So she is looking into general practitioner training. And we also have looking into digital health is Professor Sarinda Kaur. So these are other students and the program manager involved in the study. We already, Dr. Uh, Miss Tila has already gotten her MSc. So what we did was really looking into the different phases of the study and trying to understand through stakeholder mapping and analysis, trying to understand who is who and what who does what. And the four phases of the study, we are actually at the fourth phase now. Um, and we have completed uh, the training modules, um, which I will detail a little bit. So basically the map is like this. So we have NGOs and organizations that are actually very actively involved in cancer um, community work, as well as very active community leaders and organizations within that small location. And then we have the Ministry of Health, of course, and a lot of the national and state programs that is available really for screening. So you can get free mammograms from LPPKN. You can get it done in a private hospital but somehow it's never linked to primary care in the Ministry of Health. So what we have done is we work with Klinik Kesihatan Taman Medan, Klinik MPPJ, Klinik Nur Sejahtera um, in OUG. So they're all quite close. And through the partnerships, we actually have formed some care pathways to ease the uh, intake of screening in these communities. So we did a lot of early community engagements 
and then uh, already mentioned the faces and we are really now looking into sustaining this project so we provide some information packs to the clinic kesihatan about the um, how to read a mammogram for example right and then we put in information about how do you communicate with the diagnostic hospitals right Sha'ala hospital ppum so we gave contact numbers that they could call for these four cancers. So we look mainly into cancer payudara, breast, cervical, lung and colorectal. And uh, Dr. Lai also interviewed something like 53 people and to understand about uh, how the people, you know, what sort of barriers are there in the community. And uh, Dr. Hyrin was looking into how we can train uh, community leaders to become community navigators. And we have a tagline. Cam cepat, cek cepat, dengar cakap pakar, and cegah kalau boleh. And then we have a YouTube channel. So we have all our little videos in uh, Bahasa Melayu. And we will be embarking on a Mandarin one in Rebung 2.0. And we have to add prostate cancer because males, they are not engaged. When we did the Rebung, none of the male, uh, they were even asking in, you know, in the Facebook, they were ask, isn't there a cancer for males? But there was colorectal cancer, there was lung cancer there. They were not engaged. So I think Rebung 2.0, we need prostate cancer. So I think Prof Ong is over there. And then Mr. Wong is there. Okay. So anyway, uh, we also wanted to educate people about early diagnosis, screening pathways. So we use a lot of uh, diagrams and all this. So all this have been uh, put into the videos, right? And we had to do a lot of things during the pandemic through uh, Zoom, right? So there was a lot of night meetings with our community leaders and this rakanku. And then uh, Dr. Suniza uh, is the course coordinator for our primary care, cancer care in primary care course, which is a, a sort of a online program where it is put on open learning and then we have echoes with the participants. So she has actually won the, um, she's one of the successful candidates for a leadership program for women in oncology because of this project. And she will be going to Geneva to learn more about how to be a leader, which I think is very important for all of us. Nobody trains us to be leaders, unfortunately, where we are clinical, you know, in the faculty and all this. Okay. So we also have a short course for community nurses and this is led by Dr. Chui from our Department of Nursing. And we work with Know Your Lemons Foundation which is based in the US. Um, and they also, the community nurses actually come to our, our hospital for two-week clinical attachment to be familiarized again with clinical breast examination. If you are a community nurse, you will have to see everything like the you know uh, medical officers in the clinic community. But... They, they need to know more about cancer. They need to be confident about cancer. They need to know whether a lump is, could be a cancer, and what to do after that. So we have known now from a very large randomized control trial in Mumbai with a follow-up of about 20 years, there is definitely an improvement in survival for women above 50 if you just do clinical breast examination. So working with uh, Know Your Lemons Foundation, um, to make people understand about their symptoms. Remember, early diagnosis makes a difference. It's not just screening. So if people knew the symptoms of breast cancer, if they can come forward early, get diagnosed early, we can actually reduce mortality quite tremendously. So I'm, I'm very um, happy to be part of this team <clears throat> with Corinne. So Corinne is the designer who actually designed the Know Your Lemons, which is really a very innovative way of trying to teach about breast cancer symptoms. Okay, and they have a very global reach. So you can see in Malaysia, we only have about 2,000 over people trained, but you can see all over the world, people are using this material. It doesn't need language. It just needs the image for people to know what breast cancer could look, feel, and um, I guess could look and feel like, okay? All right. And then, of course, there is a strategic communication campaign uh, led by Dr. Lee and then our PhD student. So that is happening uh, over the last few months. And uh, we have a YouTube channel. And then we look at all these metrics. Don't ask me, but, you know, Dr. Lee is looking into all this to see what is the reach like, how are we doing in terms of uh, reaching 
people with the YouTube videos. And of course, uh, we want to talk about sustainability. You see, rebung cannot be in any community for long periods of time. They will, we will need grants and academics cannot do this forever, right? So there has to be a sustainability plan. And what we do is that we have produced tool, a toolkit of how we should do stakeholder analysis. How, what are the behavioral and communication enablers? And then we know now what are the diagnostic and screening care pathways and navigation. And then we can we have training modules for our community navigators from primary care providers as well as community nurses. And then we now are learning more about the strategic communication campaign content and the way to execute it. So we have the benefit of doing it during the pandemic and also post-pandemic. So we're actually going to do something this weekend. So all of us are very stressed out. So there is a campaign happening on the 25th of September in Taman Medan, and we are, part are participating in that. So how do we sustain this? How do we leave the community and exit the community? We are actually exiting the community this weekend. So what we want to do is to actually create networks. Community leaders are community leaders. They can do a lot of community projects very successfully, but they may not know who are the cancer NGOs that are very, very effective, who are actually doing a lot of the groundworks in terms of screening and uh, even navigation. Okay, We have Breast Cancer Welfare Association. They come with their bus, the Murni Pink Bus. The nurses are retired HKL nurses who have a wide reach of expediting diagnosis through HKL or even PPUM. So they are doing it. They follow up all the patients. So how do we connect these people? So I think this way of doing rebung, stakeholder analysis, on it, is very important to implement because we cannot expect somebody to give us a ton of money to just start a new program, right? We have to use existing resource and we do have the resource. And how do we monitor this? Actually, our largest stakeholder actually is the Ministry of Health and they do collect data in the clinic kesihatan. They have the uptake of uh, clinical breast examination, mammogram. Um, now they're doing HPV testing, IFOBT testing. So all these are data returns that are done anyway. So what we are doing for this project is we are measuring before and after the project. So that is how we're going to monitor this project in the future. So we have had the first physical health campaign about, um, I think about four weeks back. This is in another community. It's not in Taman Medan because we were preparing for Taman Medan. So we were learning from this experience. And um, so this is what we did. And they are all with the cham cepat, check cepat, cegah kalau boleh, right? And we have also got medical students. And the best thing of all, we have our UMMC, Public Health Department, who is really doing the project. And they have to do this type of community project. So why not partner with them? So we have partnered with them and we are very thankful for that because you cannot have the resource of a hospital public health department if you're just a four uh, a principal investigator type of team, right? So we are very thankful that we have this collaboration. And then once you put NGOs and community leaders together, linkages happen. So there are a lot of new projects. So for example, we have the community counsellors doing programs with Hospice Malaysia, for example. And then they did it during their alam sekitar, you know? I mean, so it's not so scary. People can do other things while learning about cancer, okay? And then from the project that we did about four weeks ago, um, the parliamentarian has managed to bring 39 women through Breast Cancer Welfare Association for a screening mammogram. You know, I think it's a very encouraging thing that once you put all the resources together, you have that multiplication effect. So we will be having our, our final handover to the community on the 25th of September through a carnival kesihatan with a, uh, a very active uh, community leader, a parliamentarian. And we also partner with the masjid. So the masjid is Masjid Jumhuria. So you can see Ustaz Hashimi. He's actually our University Malaya faculty member in the Faculty of Education. So we are all working together to see how we can impact this community better. So with this type of implementation framework, we can really improve 
a lot of things that happens in this uh, committee. And when we have piloted and we have found some evidence and we have learned a lot of learnings from it, we can try to roll out to the other communities. So I'm just putting up a very early impact slide. Okay, we've engaged probably about 150 people of, over this project. Three ministries, 13 agencies, two industries. Okay, we have about 93 research participants. Okay, and we've done the um, the specialist that is involved in the community navigator training module. So um, some of you are here. A lot of the lecturers from UM were roped in to come up with our program for the primary care uh, course, about 37 of them. So there are many, many of you out there, right? And then uh, if you, as, as you can see, the numbers of people trained are small because this is a pilot, okay? So we did about seven nurses in the community, 10 uh, doctors from Klinik Kesehatan Taman Medan, and then um, we have the community navigators, about 16 of them. All right. So we will have some research communication uh, during our Faculty of Medicine Research Carnival um, in the, on the 13th of October. And we hope to share more about our findings. And then, of course, I think it will not make any difference if we just leave it to that. I think we need to have a policy dialogue to, to see how we can implement this type of committee programs in, uh, in Malaysia, essentially. My God, I'm only in chapter two. I think we are all very tired, isn't it? It's almost four o'clock. So I, I think maybe I shouldn't be talking too much, right, today. And I really do not want to tire people out, right? So maybe um, I think the most important thing I think for today is that I think whatever we do, local is important before global. But we must be led by what the global um, evidence show to be able to improve the lot of our local communities. And um, I think even though I've prepared so many slides, I don't think it is fair for me to actually take this ride with you for another hour, right? Uh, I, I, I'm truthful, you know, I actually have about many slides after this. I'm going to zoom right across, right to the last three slides. Okay, so you know that I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't lie that I put four chapters there. Okay, I wanted to talk about Angelina Jolie, right? How we make decisions. There are PhD students doing decision aids that are now available for the patients to help them make decisions. We now have uh, Asian data for knowing what is the penetrance if you are carrying a BRCA gene what would be the percentage of you most likely getting a cancer? Okay, So we have that data now. It's published in New England Journal. Thank you to Professor Tio Su Huang who have brought us into the International Consortium and to come up with more data for us to use locally. So we have the biggest Asian cohort in this study. Okay. There are many, many things that we've done. We've done risk management, uh, patient decision aids, right? And then we have got... Um, Okay, quality improvement projects, all right? We've done videos to orientate and teach our patients what is happening and we have put it in different languages. We've put it on YouTube, okay? And we've, we, I'm, a, I'm a person who has a YouTube channel with 74,000 views. So I don't know, like, I mean, my, my, my age group maybe is impressive, lah, but not for the young people, okay? So there are many things that we've done trying to bring information to the patients and uh, just to share, we have had a long history of improvements in the in the breast surgery unit. I think it started off with Professor Yip. I think she stayed long enough for us to have a stable service, to be able to develop uh, a lot of the services. Oops, shouldn't show that to a public audience, right? So we've even um, done uh, all the new surgical techniques. So we actually now have done, I mean, this is old technique, lah, sentinel node biopsy, we've done it, okay? Um, We've done, uh, what else? We've done many things. And now our young people, oops, we have, we are our young people, we have five uh, breast consultants in our unit now. Four of them are oncoplastic surgeons. So they are people who can do reconstructive surgery at the time of just one doctor, okay? No need to see so many. I'm in the older generation where I work with my 
I don't know whether my plastic surgeon is here, Professor Alizan. So, you know, that generation, we work together to do reconstructions. But now they are actually doing it themselves. Okay, and then we have intraoperative radiotherapy. So this is something that uh, we use where a woman may not even know she's had cancer treatments. It's like you have a very small tumor that can be removed. Just the lump needs to be removed. Some lymph nodes have radiation during surgery. You wake up, you go and see your doctor after just a cut in the breast, cut in the lymph nodes. And then you are put on hormonal medication. And that's it. You don't have to go to chemo and all that. But this is only for selected very early breast cancer. So we do have this machine in our hospital. It's probably the only one in the public sector at the moment. Okay. And of course, multidisciplinary team means success. So we've started our multidisciplinary team in this hospital since 2003. We've done it um, just to get our pathology, radiology colleagues together to help us expedite our processes to come to early diagnosis. We've had combined meetings. Or, uh, it's very important for patients to know that when we make decisions for treatments, you really need many doctors. It's not just one doctor nowadays for cancer. And when how do we do it? We have to do it through a meeting. We call it the multidisciplinary team meeting. Okay, so we do many, many types of MDTs. We have complex cases like pregnancy and breast cancer. Okay, and then we also have NGO support in our hospital, right? Um, and we even have a dance uh you know, the Candy Girls. And I think our Sifu, Sifun is here. And we it was started back in 2011, right? That long ago. And uh, it's still alive today. If you come over to Faculty of Medicine on Saturdays, there will be a group of women and maybe some men, okay? They do dance as a form of physical activity. They are like clockwork. They are there every Saturday. Betul? Yeah? They are there, Okay. And then we have uh, also sponsorships. So we have had a very, uh, uh, we had a sponsorship for the Breast Cancer Resource Center back in 2005. That's how we got uh, administrative support, one staff, and we a dedicated breast care nurse, okay, in 2005. Today, we have an administrative staff and four breast care nurses. So we are very thankful that you know, the hospital is supporting this type of um, activities in the public setting. Okay, so these are all the stories that we have in the past. And then, okay, so now, um, you know, the past, there's always a future. So all these young people, you know, um, are here and they are all uh, going into almost, um, you know, un uncharted territories for breast surgery, okay? Some are going to do robotic surgery, some are doing laparoscopic, not laparoscopic, sorry, uh, and not even endoscopic, um, <laughs> I don't even know the word, <laughs> okay? But they are doing many, many things now that I think, I think is in the DNA of UM. UM is where people grow and people carry on and, and innovate and do new things and uptake all the new things, okay? So I'm very, really happy to be here because I think like-minded people and then you can do more for your patients. And recently, we have refurbished the, the Breast Cancer Resource Center. So you can have a look on the sixth floor. It looks very nice and beautiful for the patients. And then, uh, okay, so, okay, so that is the resource center. Then we have students doing projects to improve outcomes for infection. So infection, unfortunately, is one of the horrible things that we see when we do mastectomy because it's a large scar. And if a woman is a bit uh, large, obese, or they have diabetes, the risk of infection is very high. So this group of people has managed to reduce, okay, imagine in 2015, our infection rate for mastectomy is 30%. That's huge, okay? One in three women will have a infection, Okay. And we know that actually globally, people have put up this surgical site infection prevention bundle and they've done it for years and yet we have not adopted it in our practice. Okay, So our Dr. Sindhu, I think she's now a general surgeon working in one of the hospitals, she has actually helped us, the doctors and the clinicians and the nurses, to actually come up with this prevention bundle in our hospital. So a lot of things were done, uh, patient information sheets, we even managed to get chlorhexidine gluconate bath into the hospital, the clippers into the hospital, 
um, okay and then all these other ways of making sure we follow the bundle okay so what I wanted to show you really from that pre um, prevention bundle implementation where we look at the overall figure of 23.1 percent infection rate one in five now it's down to one in ten so about 7.3 less than one in ten and the fun the fantastic thing is in 2022 because we've put it into our KPIs as a quality indicator, we can monitor the outcome. So you can see that recently, we just had an audit. The rate of surgical site infection for mastectomy is 4%. So we can monitor and continue doing this um, implementation type of research and having more impact for our practice. Okay, I think I should stop now. part is the learning part and then we look at the successful part. So you can see look at the garden set the best use of resources and so on. Mm. Of course for you to be successful you need a team that knows what they're doing and that is stakeholder oriented. The team is very important. So I'm thinking of now where can we go to as a team now to get the team to work together so that we can be able to start is the SW Development Bank by the fund, Dennis Funder and the new project that we have started. So this project, so this is what, we, what happened in this year. So the MPP project is breast cancer that has been disseminated to all the states in Malaysia. Okay. And um, the content of this also have quality governance and KPIs attached to it that the Malaysia Society of Quality in Health has already agreed that we should put it into our standardized and standardization um, where all hospitals who want to be accredited accredited by MSQH will have to follow these this, uh, indicators. Okay? So this is our project team members. I have two co-leads, Dr. Anita from Ministry of Health, who is the head of the Breast Cancer CPG Development Team, and Dr. Izuna, who is the head of the Malaysia Health Technology Assessment. I think she's deputy director there. And all the other disciplines from radiology, pathology, surgery, oncology, palliative care, as well as nursing. So what we will do in the future is that we will be having MDTs across the city and this MDT will happen in the hospitals, not intra-hospital alone. Because six hub hospitals, which are the hospitals that have all the specialties, they have press, everything, radiology, oncology, all the components needed for very good care for breast cancer, they will then mentor the single specialist hospitals around the Greater Petaling. Okay? So we call it the hub and spokes and we are using the echo model to actually carry out this training for them. Okay, these are just the health institutions that may benefit from this project. We also have private sector on board. Okay, and we have sustainability partners. We will be working with Academy of Medicine, 
um, and of course uh, some organization from uh, global organization like Breast Surgery International and more importantly with MSQH to ensure that these quality indicators will remain something that we collect anyway because data is not easy to get right so we want to get something simple something measurable so this is the project that we did over the last weekend. That's why I'm a bit harried, really, because over the last three days, we had the um, American Society Clinical Oncology team uh, who came down to Malaysia, as well as the um, City Cancer Foundation team that came down to actually do some sort of a train the trainers for the MDT hubs. So they came to our hospital. So this is, you know, Jabatan Oncology in PPUM. Uh, they came to our resource center. Uh, they were here. Professor Zol, our deputy director, briefed them about our hospital. And uh, we also were in uh, IKN, Institute Cancer Negara, yesterday. And we did the, the action plans, uh, training for the hub hospitals um, that completed was completed yesterday. So that's why we're all a bit harried. My team is also a bit harried. Um, but I'm very fortunate that finally I get to do this inaugural lecture after many years. Okay, so anyway, I won't uh, go into too much detail here, but I thought that I would share with you. Many years ago, I put up this as a paper that I was I published. Nimala, I think now, Professor Nimala is actually carrying on to look at the epidemiology of our survival rates and uh, of our cancer patients in our hospital. And I know that these numbers have improved. So if you can see, in 2002, this is the best figures we can give you. And uh, I, unfortunately, I won't be able to share with you what Prof. Nirmala just presented like a few weeks ago, that stage 2 and stage 3 actually improved so much. From that figure is now almost 90% stage 2 survival rates. So we must know that cancer is something that you can survive, breast cancer especially. There are a lot of treatments. You can see our survivors thriving. And, um, you know, because of that, I think we have to be very wary that treatments should be accessible to everyone. So that is why I think advocacy is important. We have Mr. Wong here, our president of the uh, chairman of Together Against Cancer. And we have people from uh, Third World Network. We are networking with others with other type of skill sets to ensure that we are able to hopefully bring in more access to treatments that are usually not accessible to our patients. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. See, I've actually prepared so many slides. And uh, essentially, we did a lot during the pandemic, trying to make sure that people, you know, be, you know, vaccinate, um, I mean, the cancer patients vaccinate and all that. Yeah. And of course, we have people who are living with stage 4 cancer as we speak. And they are the ones that are really trying to advocate for more access to the very expensive drugs. And remember, you know, people thrive with metastatic breast cancer, not just breast cancer, but even other cancers. And in order to thrive, they need access to medication and sometimes painkillers that may actually be not, not really legal in Malaysia yet. Okay, so we have Olivia Newton-John, who since 2016, I think she survived and she lived a good quality of life because of good pain control from a caddy cannabis a derivative right it is evidence-based right and maybe there will be some future for our patients here in Malaysia to have access to this type of drugs so with that where is it where is it global going local is the crux of global health sorting out our local gaps through building evidence and sharing the processes of successes and failures we can share our work to solve critical global issues. Each of us has unique skill sets that complement others through teamwork and sh a shared vision. We can do more to achieve sustainable care in our hospitals and communities. So I didn't put, you know, a lot of people will put stories about their childhood and the mentors. I have too many, too many to put into my slides. So I really sincerely thank the people who have mentored me, assisted me and took the journey with me and for my family that provided me the security and encouragement to pursue my dreams, they know who you are, and may Allah provide the best for them. With that, I thank you.
Thank you very much, Prof. Noor Aisha, for your very inspiring and informative lecture. So we acknowledge that uh, Prof. Aisha has done a lot of projects uh, for the quality improvement project especially, an ongoing project which is uh, solely to improve our breast cancer early detection and early di diagnosis for better prognosis. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to inv invite Professor April back to the podium to summarize and conclude today's inaugural lecture. Please welcome, Prof. Thank you very much. I think you will agree with me that um, Professor Noraisha has amply illustrated why in the context of cancer care, healthcare professionals related to uh, breast cancer care are really the poster child for how cancer care should be, at least certainly in Malaysia. Um, it can be really difficult to encapsulate a lifetime's work into a short lecture. Uh, but from what Professor Noraisha has uh, expressed today, perhaps I can draw on a few um, essential or key take-home messages. The first one is that in dealing with any healthcare problem, strategy is great, planning is great, but what trumps good strategy and planning is actually excellent implementation. And this is where sometimes the nuts and bolts of delivering healthcare cannot just be focused on what is the most current treatment or what is the best evidence-based treatment if you do not take into consideration the context. And so what Prof. Aisha has demonstrated in her lecture is that by contextualizing what is available, both in terms of human resource, but also in terms of um, medical care itself, you can actually impact your local communities very meaningfully and sometimes at much reduced cost, either upfront or in the long term. By understanding your local environment, you can understand what prevents people from getting the care that they need. And sometimes it isn't that the care isn't available. There may be um, social, cultural, economic contexts that we don't understand. And so for those of you that are constantly wondering, you know, how am I going to be affording good care to my patients because I can't afford to give them the late, latest targeted therapy? But perhaps that's the wrong place to start. Perhaps we should be starting earlier on through educational activities and so on, uh, as has been demonstrated in Prof Aisha's lecture. I think, I think the second take-home point is that None of this would be possible without teamwork. And teamwork is possible if people stay. Prof Aisha is one of the few that, um, you know, I certainly can remember from our training days because she has just stayed. Um, her predecessor, Professor Yip, who is in the audience, also stayed. When you stay, you can work together and you can achieve really important things. If everyone is going to be dispersing and doing their own thing, yes, you will achieve something for maybe your individual patients. You will not really achieve something great for the whole country and for the generations to come. And so for that, I want to thank Prof Aisha for her service, for her contributions, for her constant striving to improve um, the healthcare journey for her patients. In this way, and this brings me to my final point, we will achieve sustainability in the long run. As she has demonstrated, those of us within the academic health centers, we are able to explore through research, we are able to initiate based on evidence base and best practices, but we are in relation to healthcare in the rest of the country, we are small. And so it is difficult for us on our own to achieve something sustainable, if not for um, collaborations with all the stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean Ministry of Health, the, uh, 
private healthcare industry, but also other um, industries, whether they be in the pharmaceutical or surgical devices industries, or even um, within other non-medical related um, industries. That really is my fervent wish for everyone here at the Faculty of Medicine, for everyone in Malaysia and perhaps everyone in the world, that we can achieve success for our patients by working together. And I think your work has demonstrated that it is possible. So please join me in congratulating and thanking Professor Noor Aisha for everything that she has achieved. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Dr. April, with, uh, for chairing this lecture today. And thank you also for uh, Professor Dr. Noor Aisha for your very uh, memorable and inspiring lecture. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this concludes our event for today. Thank you for sharing this memorable moment with Professor Dr. Noor Aisha. To commemorate today's event, uh, photography sessions will be held at, after this event. Um, and for all the audience, I would like to invite all of you to the synapse. We have some refreshment. Uh, synapse is uh, just one floor above from this hall. Uh, thank you again and um, stay safe and take care.